so we can either do some small talk or start mickey what do you like um well i mean you asked me to talk a little bit about my background and how i ended up where i did and so mm -hmm. I'm, i'm happy to do that first and mm -hmm. and you know then we can get started um Uh, this is a topic that I could talk about for way too long, so mm -hmm. you know I don't think that. But I will try to to be be timely with it. So, um, so for those of you who don't know, I'm I'm originally Swedish, and I grew up in a in a small town in the southeast coast of Sweden called Kalmar. Um, it is relevant because I, I think I was in second grade in primary school when I realized that history was very interesting, and so I've, I've wanted to be a historian since I was like seven years old. I don't think I knew that there was even a job called historian at that point, but I wanted to do something with history. Um, the area where I grew up is, is, is very rich with history. We have Iron Age fortresses. Uh, one has been reconstructed as basically, you know, world famous on, on the island right next to Kalmar. Um, we have Viking remains all over the place. We have rune stones everywhere. Um, and then there's a 13th century castle that I used to play at when I was a kid. So it's like, you know, there was, history was always part of what I wanted to do. And I say that because um, when you look at someone's career, it, it seems like there are a lot of good decisions that bring you to where you are. And I, I don't believe that for a second. I think there's a lot of serendipity in what happens in your, in your career and in your life. Um, I, there, there are, I think there were two things that, that have kind of pushed me. One, again, is passion for history. Um, uh, when I first uh, became interested in history at university, I did medieval French history, actually. So I worked on the, um, the uh, crusade in France against the Les Cathars, which took place in the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, I was fascinated by that. I, my French was pretty good. I read Latin and stuff like that. But... Um, being at a Swedish university doing medieval Europe meant that there were many other people doing the same thing. So I thought, is there something I can do that's medieval that is similar to what I'm interested in, but that is not Europe? And I just read uh, Mark Bloch, uh, Feudal Society, and he said there are only two feudal societies in all of the world, you know, Europe and then Japan. Um, I should say today I don't subscribe to the feudal paradigm. I, I left that a long time ago, but it was one of the kind of incentives for me to, okay, well, maybe Japan is something I should be looking into. And of course, this was in the early to mid 80s. And those of you are old enough will remember that this was a time when Japan was hot, right? We had uh, samurai movies, um, uh, the TV series Shogun came out, which was a huge hit here in Scandinavia in 1983, 84. Um, you know, Japanese car makers started, you know, kicking, you know, American car makers behind, you know, and becoming better and better. So it, it was it was something that that to me seemed to be in the air. Um, the problem was that when I went into my history teacher and said, um, "Look, I, I want to switch from medieval France to do medieval Japan," the answer I got was, "Japan doesn't exist." It made me very very upset. But basically, what it says that in terms of the discipline of history, Japan doesn't matter. That's what he told me. And this has, I've been carrying this with me for a very long time, and this is something that I'm working against. Uh, I'm trying to basically reintroduce Japan into discussions about history, historical theories, historical problems, and not make Japan into this kind of, the thing out there that is so mysterious that we can't really understand it. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I am a contrarian, you know, don't tell me what I can't do. So I decided, okay, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do Japanese history and, you know, I don't care what you say. So um, so I, I studied Japanese. I got a, a scholarship to go to Japan in 86. I'd never been to Japan before then. The moment I set foot in Japan, I knew that this was the place I wanted to, to work with for the rest of my life. Um, uh, mind you, I came to Osaka, not to Tokyo. I'm, I'm, I'm a Kansai person, I'm not a Tokyo person, just, just to put that on the table. Um, and, and then eventually, you know, I, I went to Stanford for my PhD and, and, and one thing has led to another. Um, so I think, you know, when, when students ask me what they should be focusing on, what should be doing, I, I always tell them not to be too strategic because I certainly was not strategic. I thought of my passion. 
And I, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, passion will carry you much, much further than anything else. Will. Um, uh, then I think the other thing is you have to be a little bit lucky in terms of when opportunities uh, come up. And I've been able to take advantage of times when uh, positions have been available and, and stuff like that. And, and so um, about six years ago, uh, six and a half years ago, I was, I was recruited by Cambridge. And so, um, and then on top of that, I was invited to become a fellow at Trinity. Um, to be honest, I had no idea what Trinity was when they invited me, and I asked my colleagues, and they said, "Is Trinity offer you a position as a fellow?" I said, "Yes, take it, take it, take it." And so, um, you know, I was, um, and it, it's not until later on that I, I realized how fortunate I am to be at Trinity. I mean, you know, um, we have very good students. Uh, we have, uh, you know, PhD students coming in who are very talented. And of course, as Gerhard knows, and those of you who've been to all of his talks know, the intellectual environment is something that you can only dream about. I mean, you have very few places in the world that have that kind of intellectual environment. Um, I mean, you could maybe compare it to these uh, advanced institutes uh, that you see like at Princeton. Um, and I'm mentioning that because right now I'm here at the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study uh, during my sabbatical, which is exactly such a place where we got people who are doing uh, theoretical physics, you know, we have people who are doing anthropology, politics, and stuff like that. Um, notably, though, I'm the only one who does Japan. So it is still the case that Japan is still a little bit of an outsider looking in, and I'm, I'm kind of trying to change that. And, um, and so the project that I'm working on right now is an attempt to do exactly that. So maybe we'll see if the screen sharing will work uh, this time. We'll do PowerPoint. Yeah. And we'll do flow from start. So hoping that you can all see this. Yes. It's working good. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll get into um, uh, my presentation. I, I've, I've used versions of this title in a number of different talks. Um, I, I had the honor of giving uh, my inaugural lecture at Cambridge in October of 2016. Um, it was a wonderful event, but then I was even more cagey. I, I called it Japan's first economic miracle. And I got a lot of people coming in from Toyota and and um, Toshiba, you know, thinking that I was going to talk about the 1960s and the 1970s. And to their big surprise, I start talking about medieval Japan. Um, so it's a way for me to say that, you know, you know, kind of interesting economic developments, I mean, don't just happen in the present or in, the, in contemporary Japan. But in fact, this is another one that is a little bit of a conundrum, a little bit of a problem for us. And I'm, I'm really enjoying this particular um, uh, project that I'm working on right now. So what I would like to do is to start and take us back um, to the year uh, 1323. Um, it's a year of no particular importance in Japanese history. Um, it's a year of no particular importance in Chinese history or probably in European history as well. Um, but something happens that year that, in fact, informs this project and above all, it demonstrates the, the kind of the aspects that I'm working on. So uh, in the late summer of that year, this ship, a Chinese junk, uh, set out from the great port in China, Ningbo. Now, Ningbo, for those of you who know your... Um, medieval Chinese history was the main trading port for most of South Asia and East Asia um, in those times. And um, you would also probably know that um, China's technology at that point in terms of building ships was the best in the world. Um, this ship measures some 29 meters long, uh, about 6.6 .6 meters wide. And in fact, it would be another 200 years until the Portuguese were building ships like this. So it's technologically quite an advanced ship. Now this ship was loaded with products, setting out on a journey. Uh, and it's a trading ship. So they are trying to basically sell products to make a profit. Um, so it sets out uh, 
at this point. And um, if we take a look at the map, you will see Ningbo uh, right over here. Um, again, the great, great uh, Hanzhou, of course, was the capital of, <coughs> of the uh, Southern uh, Song Dynasty. We're now in the Yuan Dynasty, but this was the major city. But Ningbo, again, is the trading area. And so it sets out um, and it's actually heading for Japan. But something happens along the way. Um, and this was probably not unusual. Um, what I don't understand is why it set out in the late summer, because as you know, fall season in, in, in this region is typhoon season. And it's likely that maybe because of a typhoon, uh, they sought uh, protection in this area right here on the southwestern coast of, of Korea, namely uh, in Gwangju province. And, and there is an archipelago, archipelago there known as the Xinan archipelago. So it, um, it must have sought, sought uh, cover there or something. And eventually it actually um, never made it, it sunk. Um, and, and, you know, in normal cases, we, we don't hear about them again and we certainly don't know, but this one gives us more detail than most other ships would ever do. Um, and in part, it's because it was uh, discovered in 1975. A fisherman um, managed to pick up six ceramic vessels in his, one of his nets in 1975, a Korean fisherman, needless to say. Um, and he you know, took it into some local authorities and eventually they um, sent out some people to look at it. And they found this fully loaded ship on the bottom. Um, and a few years later, they started recovering um, material from the ship. And we're not talking about a little material, we're talking about a lot of material, and I'll come back to that. Now, what's interesting about this ship is we, we do know exactly where it was heading. And that's because of these so-called mokkan, which are an extremely convenient thing that um, East Asian uh, traders and they were also used for tax collectors and stuff like that. There are basically labels telling us where each of these crates were heading. Um, you know, if you were doing the same thing in Europe, they were usually made out of paper. So you don't know where they were heading because they don't exist anymore. But because they were written uh, with, um, uh, you know, Chinese characters on these wooden um, uh, kind of tablets. And you will see also that there's a little cut on top. So there was a, a piece of rope on, on top of this one tied to the crates. Now, um, I'm sure that some of my uh, Japanese colleagues here can, can see where this is heading. Or maybe Martin can see it too. So it's, it's heading for Tofukuji, the temple of Tofukuji, which is one of the main Zen temples in Kyoto. So we know already, of course, that in the 14th century, uh, some of the most active traders in, in Japan were the Zen temples. They were the kind of official temple network for the Ashikaga Shogunate. Um, they financed much of their operations through trade. Uh, of course, Chinese artifacts uh, you know, were very, very uh, popular and, and they were the ones who usually uh, were, were trading. So obviously Tofukuji here, buying all these products, they are not, uh, they're not poor. Now, how do we know that this is 1323? Well, again, Mokkan help us quite a bit. Um, so on one of the Mokkan, on the back of it, we have this uh, writing. And um, if I help you a little bit, you will see that the top four characters here say Shiji Sannen in Japanese or Jiji in Chinese. And so the first, the third year of the Shiji area, Era, era. The first year is 1321, so we know that this is 1323. There is absolutely no doubt. Now, I've been talking to um, scholars here in Scandinavia uh, recently, and, and they are absolutely floored that we can have this kind of detailed information. So we actually know which year this was heading out. This is very unusual, but it's of course very helpful for us who are um, focusing on this research. Okay, so what do we find in this? Well, um, they started, uh, this is a picture from when they're actually recovering this. And I, I found the crate is very, very 
uh, illuminated. First of all, you see how they're actually packing things. Um, you know, it's if, if you have moved house with porcelain, you know that this is exactly how you're supposed to be putting plates so that they don't break. So I think that uh, they've certainly figured out a few things here. Um, so we have around 24,000 artifacts that they have found on this vessel, uh, 20,000 of which are ceramics. About 65% of the ceramics are of this character here, which is this kind of jade green celadon ceramics, which are extremely popular in Japan at the time. But they were also very expensive. And they know that this came from a kiln not too far away from Hanjo that is, is, you know, was famous at the time. Um, so again, they're not importing just kind of daily uh, tableware. They're importing the most expensive that they can find. Um, there were also around a thousand pieces of sandalwood, something that was very popular as well in Japan, about a thousand metal objects and so forth. And so, uh, so this has been excavated over the years. And a couple of years ago, um, they decided to have a exhibit of not just a few objects, but of every single object that they had recovered. And so this was done in, in Seoul in 2016. I'm sorry to say I didn't make it. So I've kind of found these images in catalogs and other places, but, um, and actually I was actually scheduled to go to Guangzhou province in, in October of this year to give a talk because they were going to have another exhibit. And of course that was canceled because of COVID. So I'm still waiting to actually get to see this product. But I think it gives you a good idea of the enormous quantity of artifacts that were imported and that made it, and also how well they actually survived uh, this trip. And, and here is uh, another aspect of, of this uh, exhibit. Um, of course, it does also tell you something about how um, the Zen temples in Japan in the 14th century, how valuable you know, Chinese artifacts were that they would import so many. Um, the temple obviously were not keeping this all for themselves. They were selling this on to try and um, make a little bit of, of money out of it, no doubt. So, um, so what I wanted to do now is, uh, hoping that technology is with me, is to show you a, a clip uh, about this exhibit. Um, and then you can listen for yourself and see what they have to say. Ever wondered what treasures from a 14th century sunken trove look like? Well, wonder no more. Relics from a wrecked merchant ship from the 14th century off the Shinan coast are on display at the National Museum in downtown Seoul, marking the 40th anniversary of the excavation. Our Iji Wan gives us a glimpse of the discoveries from the Shinan shipwreck on our culture spot tonight. Korean divers plunged into waters off the southwestern coast back in 1979 on the country's first underwater treasure hunt. It was the first of many expeditions to pull up a trove of artifacts from a ship that had met its end 652 years before. Now the relics are part of a massive exhibition at the National Museum of Korea, commemorating the 40th anniversary of the excavation. The relics are from a sunken Chinese ship that was discovered in 1975 when a Korean fisherman pulled up six pieces of porcelain and celadon from the vessel. After close study and analysis, Korea's Cultural Properties Management Bureau determined the merchant vessel, loaded with Chinese porcelain, coins and other goods, had embarked from Chinese Qingyan Prefecture in what is now Ningbo in June 1323 on its way to Japan. It headed north on the marine trade route that had been established by Asian nations in the 14th century. But it is presumed to have met a typhoon along the way and sank off of Xinan County in present-day Cholanamdo province. This is the actual size of the bow, giving visitors an idea of just how big the vessel would have had to be to have carried 24,000 porcelains and other goods. The artifacts recovered from the ship range from clay figurines to celadon dishes, basins and other ceramic goods. The ship also carried a cargo of spices, herbal medicines and lacquerware reflecting the products and practices of the 14th century. 
The artifacts show the nature of the cultural exchanges between China, Japan, and other Asian nations through trade. Visitors can see that the people in the 14th century enjoyed tea, flour, and incense, and the members of the upper class especially like celadon dishes and metalware. But among the thousands of pieces in the collection, this Saladin vase is one to admire. It's similar to other pieces made for Chinese emperors, both in color and style. The two handles are shaped like dragons that represent emperors, and archaeologists say it would have been handled with great care. The ship also had a large cargo of Korea Saladin from the Korean kingdom in power at the time. Archaeologists suggest the pieces, designed in the 13th century Korea style, had been sold in China and were going to be exchanged to Japan. Many of the ceramics have engraved flower patterns, showing the exquisite techniques of the era. Until now, the artifacts had been scattered at different museums around the country. But the National Museum of Korea brought them together in what is the largest ever display of Xinan artifacts. It's also the museum's largest exhibition to date. I came here with my children to show the precious treasures our country has preserved. There are so many antiques, and I hope my children have learned a lot. Through the tiny details in each of the ceramic pieces, I was able to see what the culture and trends back then were like. The museum and archaeologists hope that the exhibition will serve as a turning point for the future of underwater archaeology and shipwreck research in the country as well as a preservation of Korea's ancient treasures. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. So, um, I mean, there, there are many, many interesting things about this, this uh, little uh, kind of broadcast. Um, and I don't want to be too critical, but, um, you know, you do note how um, these artifacts that were sold from China to Japan have now become more or less Korean. Um, and of course, they just happen to sink there, but it's fine. I mean, it's part of their cultural treasure right now, that's fine. But I, I do note that with, with you know, some interest. In fact, I think that's, that's, that's quite, uh, quite remarkable um, how they managed to do that. But otherwise, uh, also, I, you know, the, um, the, the imperial vessel there is very interesting and rather surprising to me, actually, when it comes to the nice artifacts. Um, I mean, it could only have been purchased either on behalf of the shogun or possibly as a gift to the emperor. I, I, I don't see what the temple would have done with that, but it is remarkable that that's also part of the, of the treasure. Now, what's even more remarkable is that the most important thing of the whole treasure is barely mentioned. And, you know, I, I, I've... Um, I've applied to for a, a grant in Korea for next year, hoping to go there and actually do some work. And, and I, I said something along the lines that, well, you know, art trends are, are important. That tells us about cultural preferences and stuff like that. But why is the economy not part of this? Why are we only talking about, you know, the artistic styles? Again, I'm not saying that they're not important, but I'm saying is it's another thing. And in fact, the heaviest part of the cargo are not the ceramics. And so what I want to get to is the thing that is not mentioned, namely 28 tons of coins. Let me repeat that. 28 tons of Chinese copper coins were part of the cargo. Um, she did mention it once in, in this little, little thing, but I mean, you can barely see it in the exhibit, right? Um, and, and this is, in fact, where, what I think is, is the, the real important thing here, because this represents something that is far more important to the East Asian economy um, for us to understand the trade networks and in particular for unding, understanding Japan's uh, monetary development. So this is actually what I want to focus on. Now I'm using this particular ship. Uh, in fact, you know, my story starts before then, but the ship really signifies how important this import of copper coins was to the Japanese economy. And that's what I'm, what I'm going to transition into right now. So this is something I call, uh, it starts with something that happens in the 12th century. So um, on the right side here, you see uh, what is a fairly common find in Japan, namely um, uh, coins that have been um, uh, put in, in some form of jar, put in the, in the ground, and then be recovered much later. Um, 
They're usually in strings of about a thousand. Uh, they're, I mean, they're called, you know, one kan mon is what we would say, which means basically a thousand mon, a thousand coins. Um, if you count them, it's very interesting. It's usually like 990, it's very often not a thousand, but, you know, that's kind of the measurement, right? Um, now, if we're looking at the Japanese economy, um, there, there are two things to keep in mind. One is Japan was not foreign to making its own coins. When Japan emerged as a, a, a form of you know, East Asian empire based on the Tang model, one of the things that they did in imitating the Tang was to mint its own copper coins. And that was supposed to be part of um, you know, payments to officials or um, to, to fund, for example, the, um, the pagodas or the building of the Todaiji and stuff like that. And, and so Japan minted its own copper coins from the early 8th century to the very early 10th century, and then it stopped. It simply didn't get any traction. Nobody was using coins. But they knew how to make coins. That's the important part. So from the 10th to the 12th century, um, taxes are paid in rice, silk, sometimes other products. Um, and any kind of transaction, if, you, if you're selling a piece of land, you're usually paid in rice. Um, so th this is kind of the currency of, uh, you know, the late Heian period or kind of the late classical age in, in Japanese history. And then something happens and it happens fairly suddenly right in the middle of the 12th century. And in fact, we can pinpoint this to 1150 more or less. Uh, we, we find a record of, of Chinese coins. And so there is a donation to a temple of a handful of coins. Um, we find a, a transaction of a piece of land that is bought with the help of Chinese coins. And, and it doesn't take many decades for these coins to start spreading in Japan. And in fact, um, by 1179, the Japanese court is, is engaged in a heavy debate on whether to allow people to pay taxes in coins. Um, and they even have this absolutely wonderful phrase, uh, zeni no yamai, the disease of money. So, and this is not an actual disease that is transmitted by, by money, right? I mean, there were actually some scholars who thought that was the case. It's actually that people are, are now so, uh, you know, centered on, on using money in transactions. Now, the courtiers are not happy with this because their entire income is based on what they can get from the estate, which is rice. And as soon as uh, coins start to, to spread, um, the value of rice goes down as compared to coins. So coins become uh, more attractive. So the, the short end of the stick is that in the 1180s, 1190s, we find several prohibitions against using these particular coins. The court simply doesn't like it. That's not true for everyone. Um, so one of the great figures of the 1180s, uh, Tairano Kiyomori, for example, he actually allows it. He says, oh, it's fine. I don't care. It's okay. And, but he's also the one who trades most with China. He trades more with China than anyone else. So, um, so it's not entirely surprising. Um, why the court would, would, would care about this is, is a little bit of a mystery, but I don't think it's particularly surprising because as I noted, when... You, you can't control which currency you're using. You also lose control over the terms of trade. And so it's been made pretty clear by Japanese scholars that the value of rice is going down. And therefore, of course, they want to kind of keep control of the value of their taxes. And for that reason, um, the courtiers are basically discouraging um, the use of coins. Now, I should say that there, <laughs> It doesn't take many decades until also the courtiers give up. So by the early 13th century, it becomes more and more common for to kind of commute your taxes into cash. Um, and as we progress into the 13th century, by the late 13th century, about 85% of all land transactions, in other words, land that is being sold and bought, is done with the help of Chinese cash coins. So it, it does spread quite quickly. So within 100 years, we have what one might call a monetization of the economy. Now, you could argue that rice and silk were also money in a sense, but you know, the fact that we're using this symbolic currency um, is, is a, a kind of an economic development that in fact is important to Japan's um, uh, economic 
changes that happen. Okay, so what we are stuck with here is what I call the coin conundrum. Um, so one question is, um, why would anyone in Japan decide to import these copper coins if in fact they have a functioning economy where rice and, and, and silk is working perfectly okay? And it, it did, it wasn't like we had a crisis or anything like that. Um, and you know, some scholars have suggested, ah, well, you know, the traders probably figured out that it's much easier to transport uh, coins. Coins, of course, they last longer. They are not, you know, they don't deteriorate and stuff like that. Right? I mean, this is kind of the traditional argument. But that is not the reason why they start the import to begin with. And that was actually the one question I wanted. I started with when I started this part. Why would they start importing these coins? And it turns out they weren't importing coins they were importing copper. Now there is a big difference there, obviously. And, um, and we know this from a, a range of different sources. Um, one of them is that whenever the Japanese uh, imported coins, they were very particular in uh, the kind of coins they wanted. So they wanted primarily uh, coins from the Northern, Northern Song Dynasty, not from the Southern Song Dynasty. And the reason for that is that the copper ratio in the Northern Song Dynasty is far higher. And there is a deterioration of the metal value in the later period. So it's very clear that they are focused on the metal, not on what it says on the coin. Um, it's also interesting, of course, that the Northern Song Dynasty was at its peak, the, the, the dynasty, the kingdom in the world that minted more coins than any other country had ever done, including Rome. So there are certain years where they are actually minting more than a billion coins per year. That's a lot of coins. So there's a lot of copper coins available as well at that point. Um, this means, of course, that the international context is essential for this import to happen. It doesn't happen simply because the Japanese traders decide, oh, we need coins, it's much easier for us to trade with coins, but rather because these coins are available and they are imported then originally as copper because they're looking for copper, not for the coins. Um, now, as I mentioned before, these, um, uh, coins are usually coming from the east coast of, of China, so again, Ningbo, of course, being the main theater. But I wanted to mention that's often the only place, by the 13th century, uh, trading ships are leaving Ningbo, Taizhou, and Wenzhou fairly regularly with uh, coins loaded for Japan. And usually they will go up to Hakata, which is uh, Fukuoka, of course, right? They didn't always make it all the way into Kyoto as this other ship was trying to do. Um, Wenzhou is a particularly interesting case because there is a Chinese magistrate there. It, as you, I should say, this happens despite the fact that the Chinese don't like it. So the Chinese government is saying, no, stop exporting the coins. We don't want you to export these coins. And it doesn't matter. The ship comes in, the traders, in fact, in Wenzhou, the magistrate says that whenever the Chinese tra Japanese traders come in here, the, the, the town is emptied of coins overnight. So they just grab every single coin they can, despite the fact that there are prohibitions against it. So the, the, the demand for these coins is, is fairly substantial, in fact. Uh, so that, that tells you a little bit of how, what's, how driven that economy gets. Now, what these coins were used for was, of course, originally not for trade, but rather they were used mainly for Buddhist implements. Um, and this, this is not something that's unique to Japan. In fact, we, um, uh, copper was, in fact, copper coins were melted down in China itself to make various copper implements. It happened in Vietnam, it happened in Korea, and it happened in China, Japan. So Japan is not in any way uh, unique in this. But what's interesting in the kind of things that they are making of this, I think is quite interesting again. And that is the impetus for the coins coming in in the first place. So um, if we're looking at Japan in the mid 12th century, one of the interesting concepts here is the concept of mappo, which of course means the end of the Buddhist law. So now, you know, the knowledge of Buddhism has declined and, you know, the, the world is in a tailspin and nobody understands Buddhism anymore. So, you know, so now we basically have to wait for, you know, several tens of thousands of years for Maitreya to come back and kind of restart Buddhism again and make sure that it's 
um, is properly understood. Now, one of the, uh, and I should say that according to Japanese calculations, Mapo starts in 1052. So it's about 100 years before which we see the import. Now, one of the habits uh, in during these times is to bury sutras. And so they copy sutras and then they bury them. Uh, and you do this for two reasons. One is you want to maintain some sutras for Maitreya that she can then read and use when you kind of are reestablishing Buddhism here, but also because it just gives you a personal merit, right? Um, and so the early containers for this were made, uh, sometimes you find some that have been chiseled out of rock, you see some are done out of metal. Um, the most common one is copper. And so uh, Japanese archeologists have shown that the number of containers uh, increased from the mid 12th century and that many of these containers contain uh, Chinese copper. Now, do not ask me how they can distinguish from Chinese copper and other copper, but they do some kind of chemical analysis so they can tell that this is actually Chinese copper. The one on the right side is, is been dated to 1157, the ones on the left from 1170. Both of, bo both of these sets are uh, contain Chinese copper. So here is a, a kind of an ori origin of this demand for copper. Um, if we move into the 13th century, we do in fact find that a lot of Buddhist um, uh, implements are, are just not made out of copper coins, but they're actually measured in copper coins. So for example, if you are to make a big bronze belt, you need 330 kun, so 330,000 copper coins. So they've actually figured this out. So they, they are measuring you know, the, the size of the bell in terms of how many copper coins you need. And uh, for those of you who are in Japan, um, is anyone possibly close to Kamakura? It uh, doesn't look like that. Okay. But this guy here. I've written, part once, of... I've written an article for a Wall Street Journal on Kamakura. They had this okay. series where it says four hours in some place in Asia. No? And oh, they okay. asked me to write. And so I wrote about Kamakura. I, I can send you a copy afterwards. Yeah. Well, but did you write though that the copper in the Kamakura Daibutsu is made out of, is, comes from China? So they have analyzed the, the copper. So the Kamakura Daibutsu is at least partly made out of Chinese copper coins. So again, I mean, it, it tells you that, that, that just the sheer quantity of these coins coming in, right? And how important they are. And, and so obviously they are spread and this is what they were originally used for um, in Japan. Now, this of course cannot happen if we don't also have a demand for something in China. And I should say that the, the people who are actually trading with these corporate coins are usually not Japanese, they're actually Chinese traders. Um, they, they know the context in China, they know the context in Japan. And what they want from Japan is sulfur. And it's this demand for sulfur in the, actually that dates back to 11th century, that, well, we need all this sulfur for Japan. What can we possibly send to Japan? Ah, they need copper. Let's bring over some copper coins. Um, and one of the, the key places for this is the island of Iwo Jima, uh, south of Kyushu. Now, this is not Iwo Jima from World War II, but obviously Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima, both mean sulfur island, the very sulfurous islands. And this, this Iwo Jima here, we, we have records uh, dating back to the 11th century that copper was, was taken, uh, not copper, sorry, sulfur was taken from there to Hakata and then sold off to the Chinese. What did the Chinese use sulfur for? Explosives. Um, the Northern Song Dynasty's main challenge uh, throughout its entire existence are these Northern Barbarian troops. In 1088 and 1089, for example, they are engaged in a, in a, in a war with these Northern Barbarians. And at the very same time, we have records uh, stating that the Chinese emperor is requesting sulfur from Japan. So we kind of have a perfect storm here in the 11th and 12th century between a demand for something that the Japanese are plenty of and a demand for something that the Chinese have plenty of that kind of induces this trade of coins to come over um, to Japan. Okay, and now I want to switch gear entirely because to me what's interesting about this is not just the fact that 
This input of coins is basically coincidental. Uh, it's not something that someone planned, but also because Japan's economy, which was monetized, relied entirely on Chinese coins for almost four centuries. Now, if you're looking at Europe, it looks very different, right? And so the question is, why do the Japanese not mint their own coins? Did they have copper? Plenty of it. In fact, Japan exported copper in the 16th century and throughout the entire Edo period. They were not short of copper. Why don't they mint their own coins? This is the big question. And this is the question that to me can get Japan or medieval Japan into the discussion in the discipline of history. Because European historians have a certain understanding of the minting of coins, right? So in Europe, minting is important for rulers as well. It's not just important in terms of creating a currency that is used for trade, but also it's an opportunity to kind of show your authority. And I'm gonna use uh, uh, one of my favorite examples here. Um, and I apologize now because now I'm really bringing you into British history and maybe Miles will know a little bit more about this, but uh, this is a little bit obscure. So there is this guy named John de Cossy. And of course, he never spoke English, he spoke French. He was from Norman. And he, in fact, he came from a place called Courcy that you can see here on the map. So his ancestor uh, invaded England together with William the Conqueror. They settled over here in the southwestern part of England. And then in the 1170s, when Henry II decided to try and subdue these nasty Irish people, um, although their rulers were very frequent, even into this point, actually Viking descendants. Um, uh, John de Cousy went with Henry II's troops, but he stayed. And he carved out his own little kingdom up, uh, kingdom up there in the north, so basically Northern Ireland today, and was known as the Lord of Ulster. He did not have a royal permission to do so. Then. Um, and what does he do in order to kind of reinforce his ruler? He started minting his own coins. Now, this is a proven strategy in, um, in, um, in Europe at the time. Um, now, 1185, that was actually at the end of Henry II's life. So he wasn't really, he was preoccupied with his own sons who fought each other quite, quite a bit. Um, 1189, Richard I comes to the throne. He doesn't care too much about England, as you know, he goes on a crusade. Um, so it's only when uh, King John, 1199, comes on the throne that uh, this John de Courcy is dealt with. So he sends an expedition there. John de Courcy is, is, is beaten and is put in prison for about 10 years. Um, and the minting of coins there is crucial because that is something that King John could not allow. Um, so here is what the coins look like. It is one of John de Courcy's coins, and it actually does say, you know, John, Lord of Ulster on it, even though I have a hard time reading it. Um, I wish I had one of these coins. They're very expensive, so I don't. But um, it's just one example of how these coins is used. Now, one question about whether, what am I doing in Uppsala? Well, it's because Scandinavia provides another very telling comparative example. And, and that's actually why, why I'm here right now. So what happens in Scandinavia is that, uh, as you know, the Vikings were, were you know, raging in, in the, the British Isles and, and in, in Northern Europe. And the one, number one thing that they wanted was silver. And they didn't care what shape it came in, you know, silver buckets, uh, silver um, coins, uh, you know, they would take silver from the churches, as you probably know, anything. And they would take it home and use it as treasures. Well, eventually, um, they bring home a lot of coins um, that look like this. And this is uh, coins from the King Ethelred II, who ruled in the late 10th century in, in, um, in uh, England. Um, and I am, I'm happy to say that uh, this coin happens to be mine. I actually bought this one. Um, and so these kind of coins come into Sweden and you can find them even today in Sweden and in Norway and in Denmark, you can find these coins. They're, 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 and it's because this was something that they wanted. However, in contrast to Japan, the rulers in Denmark, Norway and Sweden see a value in having their own coins minted. And so they very soon proceed to make fake coins. Here is a fake coin 
of Ethelred II. If you can read the legend on this coin, I will say congratulations. You can actually see Ethelred here, if you read Ethelred Rex, right, king, right? Here, it makes absolutely no sense. It's a perfect copy of the coin, the cross, you know, the, the helmeted king, but it's because it's made by someone who cannot read uh, the legend. And also, of course, because these are hammered, when you hammer them, the mold actually has to be mirrored, which makes it even more difficult, right? So, so this is what we call kind of a, a blundered legend. We can't read it, so we know it's a fake coin. But that's what they start doing in Scandinavia. And soon after that, in the early 11th century, they start minting their own coins. So they, they, they basically eventually learn how to write the text, but now they write the text of their own king. They change the image a little bit to look like their own king. And so the monetization of the economy in Scandinavia, which happens from the 11th century and on to the 12th and 13th century, happens through the minting of its own coins. Uh, but that doesn't happen in Japan. And the, the key here to economic historians is that in order for a society to be monetized, someone has to guarantee the value of these coins. Who guarantees the value of Chinese coins in Japan? Nobody. And that is the conundrum. And this is what I'm trying to get my European colleagues to tell me, okay, how do we explain this, right? Now, one can look at certain differences. Um, in rulership in, in, um, in Europe is considered to be fairly kind of absolute. In other words, there's one king and the king decides and there's like, and then there are different arist aristocrats serving him. In Japan, you have more of a kind of cooperative rulership where, you know, the emperor stands on top, but it doesn't have any actual power. And below the emperor, you have the courtiers, you have the shogunate, the warrior leadership, and you have the temples all holding a significant stake in rulership. And so therefore, the, the organization may not be ideal for starting the minting of coins in that sense. Um, attempts were actually made in the 14th century, but they failed. So, but, so this is one potential explanation. The other one is also the different use of imagery in that the images here are extremely important in Europe. I mean, you have the cross, which, which gives um, the, the ruler the kind of sanctification of the church. And, and the image then, you know, says, well, this is me, even may not be his likelihood, but this is me, right? There is no such tradition. Uh, you have the, the, the characters that say it's a certain period, but there is not an imagery that in the same way would reinforce the rulership of a certain person. That's another potential uh, argument, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it um, kind of open at this point. The other aspect of this is that China actually abandoned coins itself in the 13th and 14th centuries by being, in fact, the first state in the world to issue paper currency. And especially the Yuan dynasty, the Mongol dynasty, they don't care for coins at all, it's all paper currency. And they actually demand paper, paper bills from the Koreans, for example. And so maybe they didn't see, but yet again, the cash coins play such an important role in Japan. So we're still kind of stuck with this conundrum. So let me kind of review this very, very briefly before I finish. Um, so what Japan has, they have what I call a mintingless monetization that kind of lacks its equivalent in other countries. And I'm the first one not to want to make Japan too unique. You know, I, I, you know, it's a, when Japan can be explained with the same kind of logic as other countries, but this seems to be different from other countries. Um, it had an enormous impact. It led to the rise of merchant classes that became very powerful in the 13th and 14th century on, new trade networks, cash tax payments. Um, by the 16th century in the Warring States period, we actually see full armies being paid in cash. We have, vassals or retainers who are paid in cash as well. So it does change the economy quite significantly. Um, and as I said, it seems that the central authorities in Japan were either unable or unwilling to control cash. And again, I don't have all the answers to this yet, but this is where I think this uh, kind of conversation with European colleagues who are experts on these kind of theories to be really, really interesting. 
Now, a change does happen. And I will say this change is not coming from thin air. There is a, a cash economy in Japan in place by the 16th century. By the 17th century, when we get the Tokugawa shogunate, the most centralized shogunate, the most controlling shogunate, we do get a coin system. And if anyone is collecting coins, you see here, we, we do have the, the silver coins here on the left side and the gold coins, which are kind of poor quality in terms of gold, but that does become a standard currency and it has control entirely by the Tokugawa shogunate. And of course, the same thing happens with the copper coins. So these are Tokugawa period copper coins that of course are based off these Chinese coins, but now they are minted in Japan and part of an economy that we today talk as being sometimes proto-capitalist. So from that sense, this use of Chinese copper coins sets the stage for a very fairly advanced economic system that helps Japan eventually transition into the modern Japan. So I will end there and thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Miki. This was fantastic. Uh, very, very, very interesting, fascinating. Uh, because, I mean, everybody, when you come from outside first time to Japan, you are fascinated how rich Japan is. And mm. many people, you know, in Europe, especially maybe around 2000 people in Europe were reading about the economic crisis in Japan and they came to Tokyo mm. and they thought there would be uh, you know the closed jobs everywhere and you know yeah. misery and then the, uh, I met many foreigners who came into Japan around 2000 and they were fascinated uh, surprised how rich Japan is no? and when yeah. you think about it it's the question which you posed or and which you study uh, comes up immediately you know this richness of Japan today doesn't drop mm. out of the sky. So there must be a history there, which you are mm. exploring now. This is very, very fascinating. Um, one thing, if I may start with asking you a question, right at the beginning, you said something like, you don't <coughs> believe in the feudal model. Did I catch this right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't quite understand the meaning of that. You know what? what okay, you well, you know, so I don't know, 40 years ago, I mean, the way to understand Japan was to say that, you know, why was Japan so successful in, uh, in the Meiji period? You know, how, how come Japan uh, transformed itself into a capitalist state so quickly? And because at that point we were following this kind of Marxist model of certain stages and the explanation was, well, of course, it was because Japan, you know, was uh, feudal before that. Uh, the problem since then is, of course, that medieval historians, both in Europe and other places, have realized that this feudal model is, is, is too broad and vague to actually make any sense. It, there is no feudal society anywhere that we can talk about that would fulfill whatever criteria we use. Um, and so, you know, and I, I see it very often, especially among modern historians, Mm -hmm. They will they will talk about feudal Japan because it's like it helps them kind of say oh well and then Japan becomes modern right and, and it's kind of a fatalistic approach right well if you're feudal society then of course you become capitalistic and I, I'm I'm more of a believer in kind of human agency and I I don't think that we should underestimate the efforts made by the major reformers and how they managed to transform Japan into you know a modern state and with some difference from the West. And, and so I don't believe in this kind of structural explanations anymore. So I, 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 I discourage all of my students to use what I call the F word, uh, which is the feudalism word. And in fact, if my students do it, I, yeah, I get very upset these days. So I think that I, I, I should clarify, I don't think that we should not be using abstraction models. Mm -hmm. I just think that the feudal abstraction is too vague and broad to be of use to us. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that we can talk about economic models, we can talk about political models, we can talk about cultural systems and stuff like that, and compare those much more fruitfully. But once you come to feudal, it's like encompasses everything. Wow. And so and it, it, it bothers me a lot these days. So and I came from that angle. I mean, I was a Marxist historian, so I came from that angle. But I realized soon that, yeah, this doesn't really help. And I, I think the best example of that is you, you ask people, well, you know, um, Japan was feudal, so let's check out, you know, the relationship between vassals and their masters, right? 
And then you, you, but if you have already said that Japan was feudal, you already decided that the vassal retainer, the vassal lord relationship is the important one in society. So that's all you're looking at. And you're only going to find what you look for. Mm -hmm. So then the end result was Japan was feudal. I'm going to look at vassal lord relationships. And the answer is yes, Japan was feudal. But that's what you said when you started with. So it's a circular reason, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we have to have more open-ended questions than just kind of relying on, you know, the feudal paradigm, as we call it. Yeah. Uh, maybe if I can ask one more question, you know, in yeah, preparing ahead. a little bit for your talk, I was, I, I, of course, I didn't know what you're going to talk about. But one thing I'm surprised you didn't mention is, and I'm sure you must be aware of that since you are an Osaka man is that there was this uh, uh, rice exchange in Dojima mm -hmm. and where they had uh, one of the first futures uh, trading of future mm. uh, rice sales and mm. uh, are you working on this as well or I mean that must no, be I mean, also I mean, part of your so, yeah so that's mainly the Edo period right so I mean that that's yeah, okay. really okay yeah Osaka becomes the kitchen of Japan as it's told, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. called right oh this um, is beyond the uh, later than the period you yeah it's later yes yeah, later oh. I mean there are other things that are interesting about the the, the 16th century and on I mean for yeah. one thing you have a cash economy mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and then the the great unifiers decide mm -hmm. that they are going to go back to rice as okay. the measurement of the samurai stipends Okay. And if you're looking at that from an economic perspective, that seems to be a step backwards, uh -huh. right? Um, and and so, so there is a political decision to basically ignore the role that coins play. But this is also the reason why the, the Tokugawa Bakufu, you know, about 100 years later, in fact, is running out of money because they have gone back to, you know, an older system and they have let all the merchants control all the cash. Oh. And the merchants are giving out all these loans to, to the samurai mm -hmm. who are being paid in rice, but I need the money now. Okay, so I'm going to lend you money based on the rice stipend that you're going to get half a year from now. Oh. So the merchants will lend them cash. Mm -hmm. The samurai goes off and buy his clogs or his sword or whatever he needs to do. And then he gets his rice, so he has to give it to the merchant. Of course, the merchant has already figured out, as you said, futures. The merchant has already figured out the rice is going to be worth much more in six months from when I lend it out, lend it him my money, right? And so this is actually what's undermining the samurai class economy entirely. Okay. 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 Uh, thank you. So, if uh, who else has questions, please. Uh, if you have questions, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Oh. Sorry, this might be uh, a very specific. Oh, sorry. Was someone yes, else? Please go ahead, Alexander. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this may be a very specific question and a very broad question at the same time. But what you were saying about the different weights of coins and how um, the distribution is based a lot on like the volume of coins and they become kind of um, valued for the copper rather than the monetary value. That mm. is like one of the examples in we the Western Middle Ages is actually quite an early one from the fall of the Roman Empire when the barbarians start stashing away all these massive hordes of silver. And I was wondering if you could see any parallels with that, how, for example, we in recent research, we have found out that it's not just random raising barbarians that have grabbed what they could and put it away for for later but rather people making long-term investments of very specific amounts of silver and gold is that in any way similar to what the japanese are doing with the copper like yeah i mean I mean, the Vikings, of course, did the same thing, right? I mean, they were storing silver all the time, although I would be hesitant to call them barbarians. I, uh, maybe they were more traders than barbarians, who knows? But yeah, um, well, in, in Japan, it's interesting, because first of all, of course, copper is not the high value that silver is, right? And so even, even in, in the East Asian region, um, silver was more highly valued than, than copper, but silver was not very... Um, convenient for trading because in trading you're using small amounts right and so one of the interesting differences that i did not mention is the fact that we're talking about a copper economy not about a silver economy whereas as you know of course 
medieval Europe, it, it, it's very much about silver, right? I mean, copper doesn't even come into the, to the store until much, much, much later in, in Europe. So I, I think that, I, I mean, one of the things I wanna do is to get a better sense of hoarding of coins in, in Japan, but they're substantially less so than there is in, in medieval Europe. And I think that because the coins were, whether they were meant to be used as metal or whether they were meant in daily transactions, they were meant to be used. So you don't find like huge numbers of hoards. Um, of course, you know, they built storage houses in the 14th century and they store some of them there and then the storage house collapses. So we do find them, right? I mean, so that might have belonged to a merchant. But it, it, it doesn't seem to be um, this, this notion of storing wealth is not very common in the East Asian context, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I, I've, for the past two months since I came here, I've read like an insane number of articles on, on Northern Europe and, you know, how silver is being transported here and there and how they're storing and stuff like that. And one of the things that stands out is that th there is this sense that wealth can be stored, right? That you can keep it and you can store it and you can get it back later. Um, I mean, I think the same, same for China and Korea as well as for Japan, but in Japan, wealth is not supposed to be stored. It's so, supposed to be displayed, supposed to be shown. And coins do not look very, you know, sexy, no matter how you look at it, right? I mean, you, you, you buy a Chinese vase or you have a painting, that is wealth, right? Um, and in part, I think it's also because um, the way that the Japanese hierarchy works is that it works a lot on, on cultural capital. So, you know, having a, you know, a, I don't know, one of the famous cases in the 15th and 16th centuries, of course, this, this obsession with the tea ceremony. And, and just like we saw the Celadon where they're, they're buying these superbly expensive teapots from, from China. And there, there is a story that uh, one of the warlords in the 16th century bought a teapot that cost the equivalent of a, of a castle. And, and I mean, and that is storing wealth, right? I mean, it's not just storing, but it's also displaying wealth. And when you have that wealth, it also it, it improves your political capital, right? So you can then, so I, I, I do think there's a slight difference there in the context. Yeah, it is interesting how, as you say, Japan is more focused on like investment value rather than storage. Mm of yeah, wealth yeah yeah, yeah and yeah, so you would yeah. say would you say that is one of the motivating factors behind the use of silver rather than more precious metals that can be can store the equivalent value in a smaller volume you mean use of, of copper or yeah, so gold and silver basically yeah that people don't well know. i mean you know if, if you're looking at gold and silver objects um i mean silver is not terribly common in medieval Japan. Gold is more common, but what does gold go to? It goes to, you know, Buddhist statues. It goes to, um, you know, um, I mean, you, you use a gold collar for um, a certain screen paintings. You got the Kano school of, of painting, which is just magnificent, right? And again, this is about, that's, that is wealth, right? To have one of those, to display one of those, right? So I, again, I, I think, I probably haven't thought about it enough, but your question makes me really think about maybe I should look into the storing of wealth more as a maybe a, a potential reason for the differences that we see between the different um, the different uh, areas. Thank you. You you talked about how maybe one of the reasons for not having minting in Japan was this kind of overlapping layers of the you know, the imperial nobility and the mm. samurai nobility and the uh, temples all kind of having, sort of, um, like, are there any comparable situations elsewhere? Um, like, I don't know, Holy Roman Empire or something? And do we see uh, a, maybe not a unified control over coin minting when that mm. happens? No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, one of the fascinating things with Europe is that, you know, everyone who saw himself as somewhat of a lord or a ruler would mint his own coins. 
I mean, John de Cousse is a good example, but in, in France at one point, right after the, uh, I think it's Charles de Bald in the ninth century, um, you know, every single minor baron starts to mint his own coin because it's part of making your claim as a ruler, right? So, um, and another good example, of course, is the, the um, papacy, right? So the papacy in Rome would also mint its own coins, right? And, you know, quite, you know, regardless of the fact that, you know, the king of Rome would do the same thing and stuff like that. What is different is that in, in almost each of these cases, there is a region attached to the person, right? That they're, they're, you can almost tell, talk about a territory somehow. So they're rarely overlapping territories. I mean, I guess the one example, and those of you who know British history better than I do, maybe Martin, um, we have the, the anarchy uh, of the early 12th century where we have uh, Stephen and Maud who are fighting for control, right? Um, and, it, it, you know, again, I, I, I have to confess, part of the reason I got into this is because I've actually been collecting coins since I was 10 years old. So this is the first time I've been able to kind of join my, my personal interest with a, a more professional interest. But um, one of the fascinating things about the anarchists, we're talking about the 1130s in, in, the, in, in England, is that both Empress Maud and Stephen, they both minted their own coins, right? And it, because that was part of making a claim to the throne, right? Um, and of course, you know, in part, that's also coming from Christianity, the missionary saying, you know, look, if you're, you know, coming from Rome, you know, if, if you are the ruler, you are, you know, Christ representative on earth, you need to show that in your, in your coins, right? That is, of course, a completely absent in, in East Asia, right? Um, now, I, I, I should, I mean, again, you know, it's a presentation, so I simplify a little bit. It, it's not quite as simple as I make it sound like. So, for example, in the 15th century, we do find fake coins in Japan. There are people who are starting to mint fake copper coins, right? Um, they're fairly easily identified, but there are actually people who are doing it. So very clearly at that point, you know, first of all, the coins themselves have a symbolic value that go beyond the copper, because otherwise, why would you take the trouble of minting a fake coin? Um, but so, so they go through the trouble of doing that. So there's clearly a sense that, you know, either they could make some money about it, out of it, or maybe you make some claim to authority. But the, the link between, let's say, ruling authority and coinage is, I think, the big difference. That they're, they're, the link is very, very weak in, in, in Japan in particular. Um, and so, I mean, it's the best answer I have so far, but... Yeah, I, I keep thinking about it for sure. It's a very, very good question. Uh, Professor uh, Yamanochi, Hisaki, uh, do you have a question maybe from your perspective? Uh, Hisaki, can you hear me? Hello? I was probably looking for the microphone. I threw, how, okay. There we go. Th thank you. Hello. I'm feeling very ashamed of myself uh, of you my <laughs> ignorance about my own history. Wait, 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 wait. Hold it, hold it. You have Uppsala University in the back there. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I want to show you my question of your university. Yes, that's where I am right now. Wonderful, well, wonderful. Trinity, of course. Oh, of course. Trinity and Uppsala. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, one of the things, um, uh, well, thank you very much indeed for, for your most enlightening and illuminating lecture. One of the things I'm wondering about is the uh, uh, state of mining in Japan. Um, mm. uh, we hear a lot about uh, mining during the Tokugawa period, but mm. not much about the mining before that. And uh, mm. uh, would you... Uh, explain please explain that if possible sure yeah no i mean it, it is a good question i mean it, it's obvious in the eighth century that um the japanese know how to mine um uh, we know that they're digging out copper we know that they are getting gold from mutsu uh, was that in as well. sado you know sado of Sa sado Hidaka. does have yes uh, it's a little later but sado of course, has very famous, famous mines as well, right? Um, when did and, that start in Sado? Uh, Sado is later, and it, it, their main production is in the Tokugawa period. Okay. 
yeah, yeah. But um, so one of the, so, I mean, one of the reasons that have been raised by some scholars is like, so in the 12th century or 13th century, you decide that it's, it's good to have copper coins. Uh, Japan is very rich with copper. There is no reason why they wouldn't have known that because they've already had copper mining before. So the question is, had they forgotten somehow the mining technology? Um, and I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I, I actually doubt that they would have forgotten it. I think they could still have gotten it if they wanted to. And in fact, as I said, I mean, Japan is like one of the major exporters of coppers in East Asia in the 17th century, but that actually starts even before that. So even as they're using Chinese copper coins in the 16th century, Japan is exporting copper, which makes no sense, right? So um, I, I think that we have to look for economic reasons for um, you know, the Japanese government deciding to, you know, yeah, let's just import Chinese coins. They're cheap, they're already made, we don't have to bother with anything, you know, the merchants, uh, you know, deal with it, we, we can use it to buy what we need to do. So I, I, I think it's more a question of convenience than anything else. I don't think that they had entirely forgotten how to, to mine, but you're right, there, there is a little bit of lull in mining from the mid Heian period up until the, the late medieval period, so let's say 15th and 16th century. But then of course it takes off very heavily. And, and as you know, in the Tokawa period, there's tons of mining going on for copper and gold and, and all kinds of, of, of metals. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank yeah. you. Oh, you're welcome, you're welcome, yeah, thank you. have to unmute myself. Okay, next, if you like, I would like to ask Martin. Mm. Martin, I think you Thank are you. very Thank close. With I, I really enjoyed hearing your talk and it's prompting all sorts of um, ideas and things half remembered kind of coming back well about um, European mm. history and so forth as well. And um, yes, it, it's a fascinating thing. That I think you're, I, I think you're right that it's to do with the in a sense, Japan's multi-headedness at that particular mm. stage that there was, because even the imperial house is actually, in order to escape from Fujiwara control, you get insane. But if the in starts to issue coins, mm. he's kind of <laughs> undermining the imperial house, which he's also using. Mm. Um, it perhaps was a way of avoiding saying it's me, which is something that yeah. they were perhaps trying to do because they, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Martin, it's a great point, actually. I mean, I, I, I've always kind of jokingly said, um, the last thing you want in Japan is for everybody to know that you're in charge. <laughs> Right. I mean, and, 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 you know, I think there's a certain brilliance to the, what, I, what I call the kind of cooperative model of rulership in Japan, mm -hmm. in that, you know, the more people who have a stake in the system, the less likely is that the system will kind of upend itself, right? Because everybody has, has a stake in it. And somehow, I, I, I would think that, and this is why I think rulership is something that's worth uh, comparing. I think the the the, the, the kind of the, the, the medieval ruling system that kind of grows out of the Heian period and starts with the Insei, as you said, the retired emperor um, system, is an inclusive rulership, not an exclusive rulership. And if you have an inclusive rulership, you're absolutely right, who's going to be in charge of points and, and, and you know, and stuff like that. Um, and I think the model, I mean, even in China, it's quite exclusive, right? I mean, that's why you have many dynasties, right? Because you know, if you've got to change who's in charge, you're getting rid of the previous ones. Mm. Um, same thing in Europe. Europe is very exclusive. And if anything, the further you go in time up until, you know, um, the kind of modern times, the more exclusive it gets, the more sacred the, the, the king or the queen is, right? And that means that there, there cannot be any doubt about the authority. So I, 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 I completely agree with you. Mm. Um, but one interesting thing is also in thinking about imagery, um, how many images do we have of rulers on Japanese coins? Like pretty much none, I would say. I'm Zero. Saying, no, Zero. I, I <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we have we have the bills, right? And we, we have the 
you know, the Nobel Prize winners and we have, you know, Murasaki Shikibu and stuff like that. But you have never seen an emperor on a coin or a bill. Well, the emperors, of course, are never represented anyway. No. no, One was fascinating. If you look at, um, um, and neither is the shogun, if you look at Nenji Gyoji Emaki, when you get a scene where you've actually got the Daigokuden and you can see um, the Buddhist uh, establishment approaching the Daigokuden and you can see the um, uh, uh, the Oza, if you like, the um, yeah. uh, Mikura, where the emperor is sitting, and you can see his legs, but there's a Misu yeah, the down across yeah. the front of the building, so his head is never shown. Hmm. And in Edo Zubiobu, where they're showing um, the Tokugawa hunting scene on the side away from the center of the city going out towards Kagoe. They're incredible, you, you possibly know it, but they're incredible um, scenes of hunting going on. And the shogun, which um, Maeda Zubiobu is probably um, actually late um, 17th or early 18th century, but it's showing Kanye, and almost certainly the shogun is intended to be Iomitsu. And Iomitsu mm. is, is sitting there watching this, but there's a kasa over his head. So you can see his legs, but you can't see mm. the face. So to mm. actually show the imperial face was something you would simply not do. Mm. And the, in the same way as names are never revealed, I mean, if you go back far enough, the imperial name is is something that's hidden because if you know someone's name, you can cast a spell on them. So you don't want to do that. <coughs> so the emperors are known by era names and not by their actual names. You yeah. know, the Shoa Tenna, nobody over here calls yeah. him Hirohito, um, even as recently as that. So there's also all these kind of there's also on the images of that time, you had these golden clouds covering the views of the buildings uh, where, where, the, where the rulers were. So you no, couldn't even, they, they were the hiding. The golden clouds are doing a, not, a slightly different thing. What they're doing is covering the bits where the drawing doesn't quite work because you're condensing to get onto your six um, uh, screen sort of Biobu, say the whole of um, Ed Edo or something like that. And you've got to jump from Kanyeji and Shinobazu Ike to mm. uh, no, uh, Asakusa. And you want to show both. And you put some clouds between because actually there's some distance and you're abbreviating it. So mm. I think the clouds tend to do that. But where they want to show a focus, they'll show a focus. Um, and the Rakuchi Rak guys are much the same, but they'll do that. I think, but um, but now I just found it absolutely fascinating, and I think also part of the kind of the the European thing, Rome and the classical world as a precedent plays a much bigger role in the medieval mindset in Europe than we are inclined to appreciate. I mm. think, mm. and that yeah. must also be a major factor in this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention utterly fascinating. Thank you. I wanted to mention um, a kind of a personal anecdote. So, um, as I mentioned, I, I, I've been collecting coins for a long time. Now, these are Swedish coins that have nothing to do with Japan and my, my current work. But when I first came to Japan, I thought, great, you know, I'm in Japan, I can start collecting coins in Japan. And, and so I went into what this one coin dealer and in my then poor Japanese, I said, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to study medieval Japanese history. I want to buy some medieval Japanese coins. And he looked at me like I came from Mars and he said, he said, there are no medieval Japanese coins. They're all Chinese, right? And, and, and I, I remember that, oh, sorry, Jesus, okay. So I gave up on that idea. And of course, now some 30 years later, I'm kind of, okay, well, that's interesting. Let's do something with that. So, so somehow I kind of managed to get back to that disappointment and, uh, and had, had I been given this live, I would have showed you a number of these Chinese coins, which obviously I've also bought because nothing is better than show and tell and have some coins to show when, when, when you do these things. So, yeah. Can I ask one more? Uh, no. A thing mm. that interests me about this whole thing is um, one's kind of looking at an emergence of something which 
by implicitly which we're calling medieval in Japan and in Europe. And how valid do you feel that is? I'd be interested to know. Um, and yeah. there's also a synchronicity, a sort of, I mean, it isn't perfect, but there's a sort of synchronicity about this monetization. There is some sort of slide, but you know, Japan's monetization and Europe's remonetization after um, the Dark Ages are sort of not a million miles away from each other in terms of mm. timing. And this is very interesting and important, I feel, but how do you think about that? Well, um, I mean, having just discarded, you know, the feudal paradigm, I mean, we, we are living now in which we're using a kind of medieval paradigm. I mean, to be honest, it's not perfect. Um, you know, uh, you know, labeling Japan medieval again, it's a way of, of comparing it to, to Europe, right? Mm. Uh, and of course there are, there are comparisons to be made. So I'm uh, fine with that, but ideally, ideally one should use, um, I think dividers that are specific to each country. So, you know, in China, we talk about the dynasties more than anything else. And in Japan, we could talk about the shogunates or we could have a different world. But as with everything else, it depends on what you emphasize. And, you know, I'm interested in, in social political structure. I'm interested in, in economy. And it seems to me that we have a chunk of time from around 1100. So as you said, beginning of the INSEE mm -hmm. up until 1600. And I'm, I'm quite okay with seeing the Tokugawa period as, as kind of early modern because mm. not only do they have many of the functions and capacities that early modern societies had, but they were also part of a kind of trade network internationally, globally, that, you know, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Andrew Frank and stuff like that have been talking about making it early modern. So in that sense, from 1100 to 1600, you know, for shorthand, I'm okay with medieval. And, and I think it also, it's a question of communication. How do I convey to people what I'm doing, right? I mean, I could talk about, I mean, I, I have my own favorite, what I would call the period, but nobody would know what I mean. So um, I have, after kind of much debate, resigned myself to the fact that I'm doing mainly early medieval, which is 1100 to 1400, and then there's a late medieval 1400, 1600. I think I think it works as a pedagogical tool, um, but if we if we hard to have like an intellectual debate on it, I'm, I'm I'm the first one to admit that there are limitations with it, and there are maybe associations one makes for one shouldn't. But having said that, it's still remarkable, as you said, you know the the emergence of guilds, you know the the increase of trade, the monetization of the economy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the kind of the, the prominent role uh, played by, you know, members of a warrior class. I mean, there are a lot of things that, you know, are, are, are apt for comparing between the European context and, and Japan. So, yeah, I, I, I guess I live with it. I think that's my best answer to that right now. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. Miki, can I, I yeah. do you have... Martin, can I ask another question? You know, I'm a physicist, so I look at the physics. You mentioned uh, copper, you mentioned silver. Why didn't mm. you mention gold? Well, as I said, I mean, um, in terms of, uh, so for example, if you're looking at, um, uh, again, going to medieval Europe, right? I mean, so silver is a, a very common, um, it's like the currency in, let's say from the, you know, 10th century and on in medieval Europe, in part it's because they find a lot of silver in Germany. In fact, uh, Hartsburg mountain or something like that. Um, but also because the coins they're making are very thin. They're very, very thin. And then in, in, in England, of course, they also start having them. And then the cross you have is actually very helpful, right? Because it gives you a perfect angle so you can cut it in, in half, right? And so, they become very practical in a sense that you can actually use them almost in day-to-day -day activities mm -hmm. to pay for things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but in state-to-state in -state relations, for example, then gold coins come in as well, oh, okay. right? Yeah, but you know, there is no such level of, of trade in, in, in East Asia. And again, gold, it's reserved for you know, the, the, 
the, the luxuries of luxuries, right? It's reserved for, especially for Buddhism, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in terms, as, as a trade uh, currency, it's, it's not very common. It, it does become more common, of course, in the Tokugawa period, but even in the Tokugawa period, if you've been to uh, one of my favorite museum, the, the Tokugawa Museum in, in uh, Nagoya, which is absolutely wonderful, uh, and if you haven't been there, I would recommend going there at some point. It, they have the most astonishing art objects and they're all covered in gold, right? So that's what gold is used for. I mean, they have gold coins, but you know, the, the, the real stuff is really used for art objects. And isn't Japan a source of gold? I mean, Marco Polo is writing about Chipango, the land yeah. of gold, where there's yeah. actually a temple entirely made of gold. And, and it's assumed that he's actually talking about Hiraizumi, where indeed you have got the Konjiki-do, but of course it's all um, actually gold on, on, on wood, but yeah. they, were, it, they were exporting gold, weren't they, from Japan? Yeah, I mean, um, so for example, before, um, so before the 11th century, when the Chinese wanted, um, uh, wanted to get um, the sulfur. One of the common objects that the Japanese is sending over to China is actually gold dust, mm -hmm. right? Um, but those mines also have a life. So, you know, the, the, especially the mines up, up north there in, in, in Northern Honshu, mm -hmm. um, they have a life and then, you know, they, they get a lot of gold out of it and then they decline and then, but yes, I mean, Japan is absolutely rich with gold. I mean, the, Again, Sado Island had gold mines. And if you go to, <coughs> excuse me, one of my other favorite cities in, in Japan, Kanazawa. I mean, yeah, they yeah, make that the, was... uh, the sheet gold. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? And not I think only that, even it... today they make, I think the, they have the market, <coughs> largest market share in this sheet gold, even today, I think. Yeah. Not only that, you can get uh, gold on your ice cream. Oh, yes, on cakes and so on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even at 7-Eleven, I think they have it sometimes. <laughs> uh, Professor Fukumoto Yasuhide, do you have questions from the Kyushu perspective <laughs> or mathematical perspective? Uh, Yasuhide? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, um, this uh, history is uh, quite uh, uh, uncommon in Japan. Uh, because uh, so uh, trading, uh, we learn uh, a trade uh, with uh, a Portuguese and uh, the uh, European country and to uh, weapons, and this uh, changes uh, Japan regime. And uh, I, I think uh, there is some uh, pa parallel uh, or some uh, intersections of uh, trade uh, with uh, this uh, European countries and uh, uh, ship from uh, Nim Nimbo and uh, uh, this uh, Xinan, uh, uh, because uh, we, we, we don't learn about uh, your history in, the, uh, in school. And I want to know the relation. Well, some intersections. Yeah. <laughs> you mean between Europe or, uh, or between uh, you know, it's, Japan, it's, China, and Japan, Portugal? Uh, right, right, yes. This is the well, Yeah. Well, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so, uh, one of my fa favorite um, NSK Taiga drama, um, I, I hope that you've all seen those at some point was the one on Kiyomori <coughs> that I think came out in 2015. Was it 2015? Maybe, maybe a little before that, 2012 maybe. <coughs> and, um, um, and <coughs> you know, Kiyomori is usually a bad guy, right? I mean, he's the one who kind of puts the emperor in house arrest, you know, he takes power in Kyoto, doesn't do much good. Um, I think it's gotten a bad rap actually, but what was interesting about that particular series was that he was seen as a kind of harbinger of the future there. 
because he was the one who was promoting trade with China. And in fact, in the series, they made him into the guy who promoted the use of coins. Now there is absolutely zero evidence that he was even interested in coins, um, but he became kind of the person who introduced coins to the court. And in fact, it's not entirely without merit in, in this big debate in 1179. Um, he's actually, um, he's not mentioned in the records, but it's, it's his uh, son-in-law, Takakura, Emperor Takakura, who's basically saying that, um, you know, the coins are here, we should establish the exchange rate between coins and rice. And then there's another faction that says, no, no, we should just not accept coins. But it's believed that Kiyomori is behind that. And so in a sense, he may have actually helped promote that. Um, and, and so, you know, it's become, uh, there's a higher awareness now today, I think that the trade with China, um, I mean, throughout the Heian period, in fact, was quite important to both kind of the, the, the general politics of the imperial court, but I, I would argue even more important, I, I would think, to the, the kind of economic developments of the medieval period. Um, you know, we have these very powerful temples, we have these very powerful nobles. And by the 14th century, we have these merchants who are founding their own guilds and are basically making up their own rules and controlling production of sake or whatever it might be. And without the import of coins, I don't see that happening. And, and the other interesting part is that, you know, you being in Kyushu, of course, you're familiar with a Chinatown in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in Hakata. There was a substantial mm -hmm. community of Chinese traders there. Mm -hmm. And it's, they are the ones who, who identify this demand for copper in Japan. And they are the ones who decide to import the coins. And they are the ones who promote the trade. By the 13th, 14th century, then there are probably more Japanese traders. But up until that point, it's all done by Chinese. And I, I just mentioned one more thing that I think is really fascinating about um, uh, Kyushu. I, I, I'm not sure if I can find that. I have it on the slide somewhere. But it was one Japanese scholar who looked at old place names in Kyushu and discovered that there were a lot of um, place names that were Tobo, Tobo. and to, Tobi, the character for Kara, so for China. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and he discovered that there were like like a dozen different Tobo uh, locations. So not just in Hakata, but there were apparently little Chinatowns along the coastline of Kyushu. Yes. Uh, Kakanatsu, so, uh, yes. Mm. Yeah, yes, and I mean, and I was like, wow. So, you know, as you said, what we learned is, that, oh, there were a few Chinese traders who came to Hakata every now and then. No, there were tons of traders in Hakata. They were living in Hakata. Some of them have Japanese wives. And, but there were also other communities along the, the, the Kyushu coast where likely other products and maybe also cash also came in that we don't know about because of course in Hakata, you have the Dazaifu that kept a record of things, but we don't have that in the smaller villages along the coast which were named after, you know, these kind of Chinatown. So that's just another aspect of that that kind of doesn't get told in history books, right? Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Actually, uh, in Fukuoka city, there is a, a town called to Tojin Tojincho. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, I think uh, this does not keep uh, the scene of Chinatown. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think the old uh, Chinatown was where the um, that baseball uh, park was, so where the castle is, right? That that's where they did most of the excavations. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Yes, yes, this is a uh, and here's a, a Todin Todin show. Yes, I... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I've been there, so it's a nice place to visit. Yeah. <laughs> Rehan, uh, maybe you want to ask something? Rehan? Uh, I don't know. She does uh, modern Rehan? stuff, you know. Sorry? Uh, uh, no answer. Rehan? No, not here, maybe. I don't know. Rehan? I had a question. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. If that would be right. Yes, yes. You, you've spoken a lot about the links between the economy and the monetization of economy and minting with uh, political control. So how does this sort of shape your ideas on 
I believe, some historical perspectives on the Kokudaka as something that was very politically revolutionizing um, for the unification, reunification of Japan uh, at the end of the 16th century. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very insightful question, especially for someone who hasn't started yet, so I, I appreciate it. Um, well, I, again, <clears throat> I, the way I looked at the Kokudaka is that they're, they're the most important um, change uh, that really happens in the late 16th century um, is stopping social mobility. Right? Mm -hmm. As you probably know, um, I mean, Toyotomi Hideyoshi himself uh, was a son of a foot soldier and he becomes the general and eventually becomes the Kampaku, so he's basically the regent, right? And of course, one of the things that he does, despite himself having done that, is because, you know, once the wars are over, you want stability, right? So he says, okay, enough of these, you know, uh, peasants becoming uh, warriors and warriors should not be farming. So he, he, you know, he starts to close all these, these class lines. So we end up with this kind of Shino uh, Koshi, right? So you got uh, all the, 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 the four classes, right? Now, in order to do that, in order to do that, he needs to have some form of kind of stable economy that, that you can control. And, and so I look at Kokodaka in that context, right? The, that when they are starting to, to assess and, and assign income based on rice rather than cash is because that is part of uh, establishing the farming population, uh, attaching a farming family to every single piece of land and say, this is your piece of land. Here is where you have to pay taxes from. And now you have some form of political control of that. Um, and so I, I, I think it, it's, it's very much part of a trend of stabilizing society after you know, 100 years of fairly unpredictable uh, changes and moves and stuff like that. Um, one, one way I like to look at it, um, when, when I do teach Tokugawa Japan, I usually split it up in kind of, into kind of two different trends. And the first one starts in 1550 actually, and then goes into about 1700. It's to say that, you know, in the, in the 1550 to 1700, you have um, politics uh, that controls the economy. Right, so they're making political decisions in order to try and control the economy in different ways, different ways, right? And of course, by 1700, we see so um, we see that there is, you know, things have changed. The the, the samurai are becoming to get in debt. The merchants become more po powerful, and and so the second half of the Tokugawa period. Now we have a situation where the economy is controlling politics, and if it's not controlling politics, it's undermining politics. Right, so there are kind of two two very opposite trends there, and and to a large extent, you know, the decision to do with Kokodaka, though understandable from a political perspective, I think in the long run was not tenable, and we, we see that. But it lasted for 150 years, which is it's about as long as the first shogunate lasted. So I wouldn't call it unsuccessful. I would just call it maybe a little restrictive, maybe. In that sense. Yeah, I think the idea that you just mentioned about this relationship between politics controlling the economy or the economy controlling politics is something I think Kozo Yamamura looks at when he uh, discusses the coins were already fading out, I believe, um, mm. during the late Sengoku period. Um, and I think he suggests that's part of the reason and the motivation towards shifting to the rice based economy. So, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, on, on, may I make a comment on that? But, um, yeah, sure. Looking at a, a family that end up being daikans of Izu under the Tokugawa and put there basically by Ieyasu. But before that, in the Sengoku period, they had been Jizamurai within the Hojo fief, that's the Go Hojo fief, um, and running essentially already they were pretty important in Nirayama and they are assessed in Kammon in the Sengoku period but obviously as daikans they're administering an area which is assessed in Koku and that's a very that shift is reflecting exactly what um, uh, Adolfo was just saying I think and what you're also commenting on so that's very interesting.
Mm, I hadn't really thought about that aspect of it, but now I think about it in Aru Hodo. Yeah. One, one of the benefits of teaching, right? You have to somehow find a way of clarifying things when you're teaching the students. And I, when I was reading, I said, oh, maybe that's a way to, to you know, think about it. So yeah, I, I think it works. I uh, tried Rehan, but he says he's in the Rain Library, so he can't uh, take part in the. Yeah, she. Uh, she, she, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so if she finds a way, she can also take part in, yeah. the, in the discussion. It's okay. Not everybody has to ask questions. That's fine. But, okay, yeah. good, good. I think we, if, if uh, nobody has questions, uh, do you want to make some summary remarks, Mickey? Or no, I, I well, actually, I, I mean, I wanted to say one thing, and that's um, mm -hmm. I think Gerhard, you and I met uh, probably about four years ago or something like that, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to thank you for you know uh, you know first creating, of course, establishing the Trinity in Japan Society, but also for all the wonderful things you're doing and allowing people to get together. Um, you know, we, we have we probably have a, a time to have a beer and, and have some more chats in the future. Um, and so I, I think it's a wonderful thing you're doing. And I'm, I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to talk about this. So, um, I have a number of talks upcoming here in Sweden, as you can imagine right now. So um, I'll be hoping to get more feedback and maybe have more clarity on, on these kind of the, the conundrum, as I call it. Um, but it's been a fascinating project. So I'm, I'm and if anyone sees anything, hears of anything, um, you know, either contact me directly or, or via Gerhard, uh, I'd be happy to hear from you. Yeah, Mickey, thank you so very much. Yes, I'm sure we'll have much, much more together to do than, than drinking one single beer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I can have a few, that's okay. Yeah. There are many, many more things I think we can do yeah. in cooperation yeah. between Japan yeah. and Trinity and-, and oh, Yeah, exactly, yeah. There yeah. are so much to do. And uh, I think uh, also, I mean, I really enjoyed the conferences you organized here in cooperation with uh, Nikkei and others here. That was also yeah, yeah, yeah. a very good in initiative, but the virus came in between really to-, uh, yeah. to plan uh, we're, we're, we're working on some things. I mean, just mm -hmm. to give you guys some background, uh, I mm -hmm. and the three uh, colleagues in, in Japan, we, we, we started a foundation called the Japan Global Research Network. Mm -hmm. uh, no, Japan Global Research Center, Jagoreku. Mm -hmm. um, and we're currently negotiating with the, uh, Mitsu Fudotsan on establishing um, some center and some projects. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, help Japanese industry, government, and uh, universities connect to particular research at Cambridge and to get more collaboration that way. And, and, and we did have a, a big online conference uh, about a little bit over a year ago where Gerhard was also part of it. And, we got a big spread in Nikkei Shinburn and stuff like that. So yeah, so we, we keep working on it. Again, I, I can't wait until I can go to Japan and, and actually you know do some stuff, but I, I suspect it will be next summer. Yeah, I started Trinity in Japan. I started about seven, eight years ago. And a lot of the support uh, uh, and uh, how do you say, like uh, kicking off was Lord Martin Rees. He, I know him mm. since 1978 or so, since my PhD days, because he is an astronomer and the cafeteria of the Institute of Astronomy and the cafeteria of Cavendish is the same. So we met many, many times at uh, coffee lunch and, and uh, tea break and so on. And uh, when the virus started, also the first, I had this idea of starting the Zoom discussions and the first one was also by Lord Martin Rees. So mm. he, he's a very, very strong figure. At that time he was master when he helped me start yeah, uh, yeah, Trinity yeah. in Japan. So if there are no more questions, thank you so very, very much, Miki. And thank you it all. would be fantastic thank to have you. a similar event again with you. Mm. Um, I cannot talk, uh, okay, yeah, no problem. Okay, okay, thank you so very, very much. And I hope uh, we can see in, see in person very soon again. Yeah, me too. Thank you, guys. Thank you much for coming. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really thank you. Many thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.